All right, everyone, starting again. Um, okay. I got now I can get it right. Wali is an eminent internationally known professor of 21st century Chinese science fiction, but in a general way, she knows the, the culture of China and she teaches. She's a professor of literature at Montana State, is it, University? Yeah. Did I get that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah, she has correct. won awards. She is just the tops. We're so honored <laughs> to have her. And, <laughs> and now her <laughs> newly know. joined colleague, who was my colleague at the University of Arizona, and we did a lot of collaborations, but now Matthias Richard is at another campus, right? The Northern campus of yes. Montana State. <laughs> but you're in the system there, but you're at a, it um, doesn't matter. He's at Montana State for our purposes anyway. And Matthias has done really groundbreaking work on these um, barriers between cultures, not only international cultures, but within our own country of class, race, and gender. He has done some fantastic work on street novels and other types of fiction that were not even considered worthy of being studied in the university. And now we are learning that a lot of the standards need to be interrogated, not just the novels. So um, he's done many other things that are amazing. He's worked in parts of Tucson where they were underserved for technology and he has helped students in the community and also mentored other, other students within the university. So, you know, I, I can't say enough good stuff. I won't continue for an hour talking about Matthias, but he's also a colleague in the literature field, teach a professing literature in Montana State University. So what they will be um, trying to explore from two very different points is this uh, film, this suppressed and under-distributed film, Dark Matter, which came out in 2007, I believe, and then proceeded to go to the Sundance Film Festival where it won the highest film award for the depiction of scientists and the people engaged in science and technology, the Alfred P. Sloan Award. That is a very prestigious award. And then it was suppressed because of a certain element of timing. I won't go into all that, but um, very few people, I'm just going to say this, got to see this film and now it has gone out on YouTube, where I think up to hundreds of thousands, if not a million people have watched it, and uh, very few in the United States. So uh, with that, do you think you need any more scaffolding, folks, or can we start? I can, I can put out an initial question to you, too. Um, maybe I'll just go with, what did, how did you like this film when you saw it the first time, either of you? Yeah, actually, it's better than I thought. I know this film, I, as I told you mm -hmm. earlier, <clears throat> when this film was still in production, I knew it already because I knew the, the true story. It was heartbroken for me because I was a international student too, right? So, you know, you, you heard some this type of tragedy so I was kind of very hesitant to revisit even though it's fictionalized if you yeah. didn't ask me to do this presentation I would never watch it but I'm glad I, I watch it I, I really like it I think the film was very well done and also underrated I think yeah and then maybe I'll have you, you know, do a little short mm -hmm. presentation, but this is just an off the cuff first question. And then mm -hmm. you can each do a, a short thing. Matthias, sure, sure. how did you like this film? So um, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat that I, I had heard of it when it was first being released and produced, but I didn't really pay attention to it until, you know, um, looking at it for the sake of being part of this more academic discussion on like science fiction in, or the hard sci-fi group in uh, media studies, uh, both in literature and in film. Um, I, I, I think that the film is very interesting on many levels. And of course, as you mentioned, um, it part of the, I think part of the reason that it didn't get as much attention as it probably deserved was due to the the poor 
Kairos, the poor timing of of its release in terms of the reception and the interest in it. Um, you know, it it came out the same year as the Virginia Tech shooting, I believe, and which of course bore, bore some resemblances to the Asian American who carried out the shooting there. And um and of course, even as I was finishing my PhD uh last year, um there was another shooting of a professor on campus by a disgruntled, underappreciated, underrepresented group on camp person, a member of these groups on campus at University of Arizona. Arizona. So, so it, you know, it, it carries a lot of significance for those kinds of personal reasons, but also like on the level of study as a, as a film or as a piece of art with a, with a capital A, <laughs> which I, I think it definitely deserves to be, um, part of that kind of group of high art films for the way that it's put together. Um, it's, uh, it works on many levels in terms of highlighting the inequities within kind of the structure of managed professionals within academia, the exploitation of graduate students, postdocs, all these people who fit into these roles that, you know, there's really only two roles in the university that have no definite limit to them which is being a phd student and being a tenured professor <laughs> and one has all the power one has none of the power uh, <laughs> and so um it's interesting on that kind of level of organizational representation of the structure of organizations in academia and also cultural representation beyond just the issue of academic classes the um the way in which people from the west understand people from the east and the way also people from the east understand people from the west through these kinds of stereotyped archetypal lenses right like the the whole kind of cowboy <laughs> um, scene and the the um the hijacking of their neighbor's cable to watch western pornography and all of these <laughs> kinds of lenses through which they're seeing the west and then alternatively the way through which westerners are seeing the east through its food through certain kinds of plays and performances um and through language and mannerisms even i think that it's a very interesting and well done film so <clears throat> so do you um well going on from here Huawei, do you have any kind of uh you know little talk you want to give about the production and the things that we wouldn't have known because we're here. Yeah, sure. I try. Yeah, yeah. I prepare a, yeah, do a short PPT okay. <laughs> presentation right. slide, basically uh, yes. focus on the uh, Chinese motifs in the film. Mm -hmm. So I kind of share my screen with the audience here. Yeah, you have. I put it on uh, multiple people. OK, pictures. OK. Let me. Oh, I should let add. Yeah, oh, I let me. Yeah, I think I. I can, I can share. Yeah, I can share. Let me. Can you see my PowerPoint here? Yes, I can see. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, let's. Uh, I I'll mainly focus on these. Uh, some important motifs in this film. So I, as all you know, this is based on a true story, right? On a Chinese student named actually Lu Gang, who was born into a working uh, class family in Beijing. And he was quite talented. He was admitted into physics department in Beijing University at the age of 18. Then after graduating from Peking University, he went to continue his uh, doctoral study of physics and astronomy in the University of Iowa. The tragedy actually happened in 1991. In reality, it's different from the film. In reality, he, he shot actually six people, five of them died and one paralyzed in her entire life, including actually the, the, the lady in this film, Joanna, right? But in reality, he also, you know, kill this lady or even she. I know the one was parallel, paralyzed was also a female. So I'm not sure if uh, mm, that's the, the fictional Joanna. Oh no, I think Joanna in reality died 
too. So yeah, this is uh, the the real tragedy. So I'm yeah just focus on all the Chinese motifs. I, I don't know. Probably you all notice that both the opening and closing scenes in the film, right? Especially the beginning start with John uh, Strip playing Tai Chi, right? Also the at the closing scene. She was also playing Tai Chi. Then all of a sudden, she realized something bad might happen, so she rushed to the campus, but it was too late. So I think Tai Chi also important play a very important role. We we all know that Tai Chi is kind of very slow movement, right? Uh, exercise. So, but it was domin it is dominated by mental activities and also kind of pursue a state of a pure mind, empty body, and a powerful spirit. But also Tai Chi related to Chinese philosophy. So actually Tai Chi combine achievement of ancient Chinese philosophical thoughts. The Chinese invented two diagrams to describe the development of universe. One is called Wu Ji diagram. Wu Ji literally means no, no extreme. So which is a sign that resemble a kind of a circle, empty and boundless. So it explains basically everything is born from nothingness, everything returned to nothingness and everything is nothing. So this is also corresponding to the Buddhist, you know, Buddhist belief that the world in essence is emptiness. But another diagram is a Tai Chi. You can see <clears throat> the, the, the bottom picture here. This is a very typical Tai Chi uh, diagram, which has a two, like a pair of so-called yin, yin and a yang fish in a circle rotating endlessly and also changing in all kinds of uh, uh, ways. So Tai Chi also contain the, basically Tai Chi you can see from this paradigm, it's a one entity divided into two parts, right? Then a conflict and struggle opposite and complement each other. So this kind of Wu Ji and also Tai Ji concept corresponding also to the chaos theory in physics, right? Yeah, so because uh, science has discovered that chaotic motion is everywhere, but chaos and order are opposite, you know, and they can evolve into each other things that appear to be chaotic, but are actually also orderly if you see them from a different uh, view or angle, right? So I think Tai Ji here, the film star with the Tai Ji is very, very meaningful. So another one, actually, the Wu Xing, which, <laughs> which Gloria has sent us uh, several emails, right? Yeah, showing us her uh, explanation or her understanding of Wu Xing, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's very true that Wu Xing is also another Chinese uh, philosophical concept to explain, explain the world. So I can see, because, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I got those two images from the Wikipedia that Gloria sent it to us. So we can see Mu, actually the film. Uh, the film is structured by those five elements. So start with Fu, Fu means earth, right? Then Fu, then move to Jin, gold. Then we move to water, then move to wood. The move to Huo fire, you know, the shooting scene at the end, right? Also, actually, in traditional Chinese concept of those five elements or five faces, agents, they represent different color, represented by different colors, also corresponding to the uh, five five planets, right? And we can see. I'm not going to just repeat those, but basically, they 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 worked interlocked and have different. Uh, functions or you know different interaction with each other. So those connected into basically the five elements are connected in two cycles of interaction. And um, the positive one is the generating or creation cycle, right? Another one is overcoming or destructive cycle. It depends on the direction, which direction you're you're seeing. Especially this chart, the second chart, I'll show you, right? Mm. So let's look at the, how the film. I also do some screenshot of the of the film. So you, you see that it started with to the earth, right? Yeah. Also, it matching actually means to Xing Saturn. Also, 
the character pays off in its earth soil, but I understand that in this film, it start with earth also represent the innocent of, you know, this young graduate student first came to America, native, uh, you know, left home native soil and coming to a beautiful country, right? And also, I think Gloria also mentioned that the earth represent all sunny and dry and Liu Xing was accepted by the team warmly. Oh, by the way, the Chinese name of the student Liu Xing, Xing means star. You know, oh. so I think the the director chose this name also have some meaning there, star, right? Mm. So then move to Jin, right? Jin, Jin Xing in Chinese means mirrors. And also Jin by itself, the character means gold, glittering, smooth, and also valuable, right? So we can see in this episode that Liu Xing, the protagonist, was at the beginning, right? It was left by Professor Rector and fully embraced American culture. You know, they visited the pioneer village, right? Do a kind of uh, dress up, right? Costume, play everything, went to the opera, right? And welcomed by church, everything, right? Talented young <laughs> doctor student with great prospect. And also he very proudly say, I'm a scientist, right? I'm a scientist. I can do, I, I, I want to win a Nobel Prize, all those kind of uh, you know, talking, passion, everything, right? Then move to, oh, yeah. then you see move to water, water mercury in Chinese, right? Also means water fluid, right? We can see in this, episode or this section of the film, his dissertation pro, uh, proposal was denied, right? And also he was kind of debating, should I follow Professor Reiser's model or I should work on dark matter to derive my own theory, right? So it's kind of uh, corresponding to what is uh, debating fluid, right? Then next section move to Wood, Mu, right? Mu, also Mu Xin, Jupiter. In Chinese, Mu itself, the character itself means wood, but also, you know, very non. So I understand that this section shows his dissolution, right? Because his dissertation defense failed. And yeah, actually, here is my question. Did he get his PhD or didn't? My understanding is that he didn't, right? He didn't get his PhD. No, right? But mm. then, yeah, I believe yeah, they push because... they push him to go to another school. That's kind of what they're suggesting. We'll write you a recommendation so you can yeah. start somewhere else. Right, mm -hmm. right. He didn't get it, but you know, in reality, I read the news. Maybe the news was not right. the The real uh, person, the student, did get his PhD. So I'm I'm confused. So yeah, basically he, he didn't get his PhD and then was selling beauty products, right? That's a very <laughs> unfortunate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, I don't know if you notice this kind of, I feel it's a kind of black humor because when she when he first met the girl, right? In the tea yeah. shop, he yeah. said, oh, I'm, I, I study cosmology. Then the girl said, okay, maybe you can give me a free makeup. Right. Then later the girl said, oh, I realized that uh, cosmology doesn't mean skincare or beauty care. Right. But you see, at the end of the film, he ended up with selling beauty products. Right. I feel it's such yeah. a kind of yeah. irony or black humor, right? Yeah. Whatever you, <laughs> you understand that. So then the last section of the film, Huo, right? Uh, Huo, you, you see in the Chinese Wu Xing, Huo is represented by red color. Also, we, we know Huo is red, but you see when this character appear in the screen, it's gray and he was lying underneath the snow, right? Almost covered by snow. I, I found this is kind of interesting, right? Gray instead of uh, red color. Right, then Huo Xing in Chinese, Huo Xing means Mars, Mars, right? Mm -hmm. Then Huo itself means fire, but anger, cruelty, right? Then it led to the shooting scene. So I I, I think I agree with Gloria, right? Those five characters means a lot. Actually, the <laughs> whole film, the narrative is structured around those five characters, five symbols, right? 
quite meaningful. And also I noticed that I put it here in the film, he wrote six letters to his parents. Actually in each section, he wrote one, except the last section, fire, he wrote two letters to his parents. And also I remember, if I remember correctly, starting from the fourth letter, he started to lie to his parents. His proposal was denied, but he told my, his parents that my professor was very happy about my proposal and allow me to, to write my dissertation, right? Yeah. So these are the five elements. Another important motive also, you know, uh, Gloria mentioned a lot, the journey to the West, right? So um, journey to the West, we probably, it, I think it's a quite not really new to Western audience. It's a Chinese, classic novel published in the 16th century during the Ming Dynasty and authored by, by Wu Cheng'en, right? So it's a basic legendary pilgrim of a Tang Dynasty monk named Xuan Zhang who went to the West, but this West doesn't mean the Western world, but the West means Central Asia and India to obtain the Buddhist Sutra. And he was protected uh, accompanied and protected by his three disciples. One of them is Monkey King. So after all those ordeals and the sufferings, they they got the sutra and brought them back to to China to 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 the uh, Tang Dynasty. But I do see a parallel here. It's quite obvious, right? Yeah, because uh, you see the Xuanzang, the monk, right? His disciples went to the West to obtain sutras. Then those Chinese students came to the West to learn advanced you know, sciences and technology. And also it's very evident that in the film, I put some time here, right? Yeah, so at the 17 minutes, the 18th minute, the opera, but also at the afterwards reception strip said it clearly, I propose a toast to our wonderful performers and our new Chinese students who have made their own way or journey to the West, we like to welcome you know, to our country. Then Liu also, you know, <laughs> gave a kind of very short uh, speech, say that on behalf of Chinese students, we are so lucky to come to the America. Then he say, "Meiguo." Meiguo is a pronounced Chinese pronunciation of America. Literally means the beautiful country. So may we all find our dream here, right? So. It's a very obvious parallel uh, between the uh, journey to the West and the, the international Chinese students from China. But also I found another very intriguing um, coincidence about this, this thing. Actually, the monkey king, his Chinese name is Wukong. It's a Buddhist uh, um, name and also have Buddhist implication there, Wu. Wu Kong Wu means to understand. I put it here, right? Wu to understand. Kong means emptiness. So Wu Kong to understand emptiness. Liu Xin was starting black matter. He he said in the film that oh we can see that actually ninety nine percent of the universe was seem yeah, seemingly empty, void. However, in the wideness there are uh, the wideness is full of dark matter. So here, Wu Kong also, you know, corresponding to to the Monkey King's Chinese name, and also I found that China actually in twenty fifteen December seventeenth, China's first dark matter particle detect, uh, detector detection satellite was named Wu Kong, and it was successfully launched from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. And also the satellite successfully entered the scheduled transfer um, orbit. So basically they're going to use this detector to detect evidence of the mysterious dark matter at an orbital altitude of 500 kilometers. So um, this detector was launched in 2015, but the film was made in 20. Uh, 2007, right? So I, I have to say it's just a coincidence, but it's an intriguing <laughs> coincidence because this film, you know, in, incorporate Journey to the Wise and also the Monkey King there, then the Monkey King's name 
with Wukong running a Chinese uh, <laughs> detection satellite. He's named Wukong. So I think it's, it's a beautiful instance. They are also related to dark matter. So then some other things I would like to then the dark matter. Um, for, I don't know. Yeah, I caught something here. Maybe, I don't know, do we have time? I want to actually show this. Uh, no, sorry. Where is the side effect? I want to show something. Oh. The film, maybe. Okay. I think it's gone. Let me see if I can find it. No, sorry. Yeah, originally I would like to to, to show the some sequence of the film, the conversation about the the black matter, but you can see the the uh, uh, dark matter here. So Bill Street asked, "Oh, looking at stars?" He said, "Oh, I'm looking at dark matter." Then he explained, "Right, what is dark matter?" I feel this conversation is just beautiful, beautiful, right? So there are things we cannot see even if with the most powerful telescope. So you know, I can quickly read, read it here, yeah. So the rest of mountains dark matter and 90% of the universe dark matter. But... That's a very poetic, I, I'm sorry to break yeah, in, very, but it uh, almost makes right, me cry. Right, yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. That's why I would. Yeah. Originally, I I opened the the YouTube movie. This yeah, that is somehow I can't find it anywhere. But also the next slide is about the conversation, Liu Xin's conversation with <clears throat> with Professor Gasta, Professor Rizas, a uh, former supervisor. Right. So conversation about universe. I think it's also something uh, here. Knows uh, worth noticing. So, the... you can see here, I code it here. It's interesting to notice that Dr. Gesta said that we both come from cultures that propose a universe with no beginning and no end. Yet, here we're discussing the Big Bang, right? <laughs> so, Many beginnings, then Leo said there may be you know, many beginnings and many big ones, right? Then later, you know, when Liu Xin was having coffee with a girl in the tea shop or coffee shop, right? The girl said, a God is eternal. Then Leo said, in my theory, the universe is eternal, right? Then Big Bang is just a major event, but not beginning. Universe has no beginning, no end, just like God, universe and God, he said, is the same. So are the same. So no beginning, no end. So it also means a, a, a kind of cycle, right? The whole universe is a cycle, then corresponding to the Taiji, right? To the yin yang, to the Chinese philosophical understanding of the universe. Then we also see the Wu Xing is also a kind of cycle there. So they all linked together, I feel, right? Yeah, let me see if I have, oh yeah. Then make connection. Gloria also repeatedly mentioned this thing to us, right? Mm, making um connection. So uh, it's noticeable that Joanna had a conversation or street conversation with her husband, right? So I I I bring Monkey King from Salt Lake City. I just want to make a connection with those new students, but look at what her husband said. <laughs> I don't want to make you know, to make a connection. I'm kind of connected out. There's a type of contrast here and also connected out. We can see as a, at the end of the film, this tragedy, actually both Liu Xin and also the Professor Ressa, both of them connected out, right? Yeah, that's something we can discuss later. Mm, this scene was so touched, I have to say, I cry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this scene is was from that Liu Xin was selling beauty products, right? She went to Strip's house selling, so try to try to sell the beauty products 
to her. But I don't I don't think he really mean to sell. Probably he wanted to talk to strip, but he just didn't know probably where to start, where to, to end. And also strip was also heartbroken, right? She was crying, also didn't know what to say, right? When he left. This was a very touching scene, I cry. <laughs> then some other motifs. Chinese theme songs soundtrack. I don't think I exhausted all of them, but I noticed that the the Chinese song, the chorus, thinking of my hometown. This theme song started uh, appear in the early part, especially the the two, the the earth section. I heard that, and also the second one, past, uh, pastoral. You remember that also, I think this is in the, the gold section, right after the party, Strip was giving a ride to Liu Xing. Mm -hmm. So on the way back in the car, Liu Xing was singing a song. Then Strip said that I like that song too. Then they, they sang together, right? So you know the, the, the white sheep was under the blue sky and under the white cloud, right? They, they were singing and Later, strip was even singing in English, right? The, 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 just the, translating the Chinese lyrics. Then at the end, another Chinese song, "Remembrance of the Past." That's in the later part of the of the film. I feel those all those three songs are highly relevant. They didn't throw it random, throw okay. them randomly there, right? And also okay. the two English songs. I think there are more. But Amazing Grace was sung by Lawrence Fung's wife, right? I think it was a party, is that a wedding or not? Wedding or party, I forgot. So anyway, the, the lady from Shanghai, Lawrence's wife, was singing Amazing Grace, that's a religious song, right? Then at the very end of the film, you know, even accompany the shooting scene is this song, The Land is Your Land. I feel it's kind of ironical, right? Is this land really everybody's land? Is this really your land, right? And also we have a bar a music there throughout the film, right? Especially in Strip's house. I think a few times she was playing uh, bar, you know, there. Yeah, I think that's all I Could want I, to, to share. To, sorry. Oh, sorry. Do you want uh, me to? Could I add one? Could you go back to the music slide, please? Oh, okay. Then I have to share again. Oh, okay. Well. Oh, yeah. yeah that's fine. That's fine. I can share. I just yeah. wanted to add. I think it's very important that the opening music it isn't credited, and I don't know why, but it's the Largo from Dvorak's Ninth Symphony from the New World, and it was thought. Oh. Spiritual, so it's a mistake of cultures again where people thought it was a real spiritual. It was inspired by African American spirituals, but that is the mm. opening music, and they credit the choir, heavenly choir, but they don't credit it being Dvorak. And I thought oh. that's it because it was their own little arrangement and they gave it a uh, mm. name like Nostalgia, but it uh -huh. was known as Going Home, Going right. Home as a spiritual. And because that opens, and then the the, mm -hmm. the Big Bang, the first one in the movie, goes during that from the new world. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of very, um, but being sung in Chinese, and I've never heard that before either, you know, from the new world and the spiritual by the Black people, but it was sung in Chinese here. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, that's all, that's all I want to say. <laughs> mm. Okay, well, we'll move along to Matthias then. All right. Thank you very much, Wally. We never could have known that, by the way. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. Yes, thank you. You've provided some so many other layers of symbolism that I wouldn't have even been able to consider the the kind of background connections to. And while I've been trying to tie these connections between the symbols, you know, of the the earth, the wood, the metal, the fire, to the to the narrative, you were able to explain that much more in detail than I ever could have. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I uh, it's interesting though, like it, 
even before I get into what I was going to say, um, this this has been this this notion between like kind of the emptiness at the basis of the universe and the presence of things of matter that's not dark matter but the actual things we can see and touch like there there is definitely a that has that the debate between whether or not to focus on the analysis of the things that we that can we consider matter and the things we consider the absence or emptiness of matter has been at the root of the philosophy of science in the west as well for you know millennia i you know the just getting into the the science the, the philosophy behind the science in this film or even the the metaphysics behind the physics you know um as you, there's even as far back as ancient western you know greek philosophy of science plato aristotle socrates these kinds of, of figures were very much interested in the presence of forms and the things that you could see and measure and um that there would be there are distinct categories of things each with their unique properties whereas a lot of the pre-socratic philosophers right like parmenides archimedes pythagoras saw the world as kind of a a composition of patterns of things that all had at their basis an undefinable singular quality, but just manifested in different ways that didn't necessarily have a beginning or an end in the way that the Platonic philosophers and eventually the Christian philosophers and the Roman philosophers would take up from their readings of Aristotle and Plato and these kinds of people. So it was really only in the post enlightenment that the west began to return to some of these concepts i mean one of the earliest ones i can think of might be like leibniz in france who or maybe he was in the netherlands he kind of went back and forth but he you know he kind of kind of came up with like the concept of the imaginary number as we know it today you know the i that we're all taught in in mathematics in elementary or in middle school to, to resolve the, the square root of a negative number, which shouldn't exist. And yet we had to come up with mathematics to describe something that is nothing, <laughs> something that doesn't exist. And, and, and from this, we get the basis for things like dark matter, things that are nothing, but, and yet they make up something in the universe. And, and then it kind of, took off in the 20th century with people like Jean-Luc Nancy and Heidegger and some of these other people. Oh, sorry about that. Notification. Okay. Um, but, you know, so th there's always, it seems to be this tension in the West between an emphasis in scientific analysis of the things that we can put our hands on and the things that we can't put our hands on um, that seems to be resolved in many ways in the, the Chinese kinds of versions of metaphysics or explanations of the universe. And, and that manifests, I think, in this film as well with, with um, Lu Jing's kind of his theorization of dark matter as opposed to the Reiser model, which overemphasizes a description of the universe that starts with the big bang it has a concrete formation of physical matter that we can quantify and see and just like lu jing dr gazda as you mentioned also i'm not sure exactly does it mention in the film specifically where dr gazda is from like eth ethnically or nationality wise no, I was kind of wondering. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't make it very clear at if all. It, if he came from a explicitly non-Western country. Oh, G Gloria, did you did you I have a... I looked up the actor, and the actor's from India. Oh, okay. Oh, from India. Okay, oh. that makes sense. <laughs> that's And that's the original destination, I believe, in Journey to the West, right? Is that... Oh, yeah. Right, the Monkey right. King is going to India. Uh, to India, right. To which get, is you know. southwest of China, I guess you could say. Yeah. 
It's right, ironic that what we, what we call the West today is actually most Chinese people will have to go east to get to the west if you go over the mm -hmm. pacific ocean rather than going all the way west across europe to get to the united states um, but um these these philosophical tensions are kind of at the the deep basis of the of their scientific di disagreements i think whereas um while the while he is bringing this 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 philosophy behind his science to the United States he is at the same time, you know, at least for the first half of the film, very, very desperate to fit in um, with American society. He's attempting to, you know, blend in with the Christian missionary kind of mission, even though as it's revealed in the conversation with his other postdoc or, uh, PhD student colleagues. They're mainly there for the food and the free rides and these kind of more utilitarian things. I mean, I think they explicitly say at one point, you know, we already have Taoism, Buddhism. Why do we need Jesus? Because <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very kind of uh, extraneous addition to what they need out of life. But the material benefits of being part of the mission are kind of an inside joke among them. They're just trying to survive with that in environment. But at the same time, he does authentically, he is authentically drawn to these popular representations of uh, of American culture. And, and the two main things that I was interested in for my own scholarly background in media studies in this film were the popular representations, how those function to both attract and also mislead people in the movie uh, about their understandings of each other's cultures like there's um you know the cowboy like kind of fantasy of being in the wild west town which also functions as foreshadowing a little bit because with the gun you know it's a revolver just like the one at the cowboy town that he uses at the end you know he's not using a a glock or a, you know some sort of uh automatic pistol he's using this very like this cowboy gun essentially to do the shooting um, which is kind of foreshadowed in them getting shot in the in their cosplay in the at the at the cowboy town. Um, and also the realization, you know, I think even though the even though the pornography is not like explicitly shown, like I had mentioned at the beginning, um, there's that moment of realization that they have later in the film, right? That this is fake, that this is performative. This is not a real, orgasm if you will this is being put on to attract us into to buy into the cultural production that america puts out um as opposed to uh anything that's an authentic kind of connection and the authenticity of the connections you know getting back to the the quote only connect are always in question um his connection with his family while he's sending them cash and they're sending him food and there is an authenticity to that there is, you know, he's also lying later in the film about his relative success. You know, he's saying that universities are begging to hire him, even though he is not no longer even in a Ph.D. program and his authenticity as a salesman for these beauty products. We all know. And I think part of the situational irony or or, you know, the the sadness in that scene is that everyone in the scene, the viewer and both of the characters know that this isn't what he's meant to be doing. It's not what he wants to be doing. Um, and the, the authenticity of his connection to his, to his, to his mentor. I mean, his mentor is able to flatter him with material possessions, right? Like cigars and scotch and going to a conference to meet women apparently he seems he's not necessarily the the most ethical kind of professor <laughs> but um all of these like material possessions that are meant to solidify the relationship between them are really misleading him from the fact that this this man isn't necessarily any different from what he was expecting in china when he claims that part of coming to america is that in china you cannot disagree with your teacher because it would bring dishonor on you as opposed to in the united states where you can have these freedom of expression 
but that isn't necessarily true either. You know, they they expect him to, in the words of Reiser, to to pay his dues. Um, and so there's even though and 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 also with Meryl Streep's character, while she seems to be authentically trying to connect, she she's doing so through the leverage that her her privilege provides, right? I mean, she is probably the most aristocratic kind of figure in the in the film, in the sense that she and her husband have provided the endowment for Reiser's research. Um, she is the one who is facilitating Chinese doctoral st students being integrated into the community or finding host families or finding places to live. Um, and she's the one putting on these these galas, these fundraisers with um with you know Chinese theater events and with Chinese food, which you know her her husband says that he's all connected out. He doesn't care anymore. Reiser says he doesn't even like Chinese food. You know, there's all these moments, these these inside moments between the the white westerners in this film that highlight that a lot of their attempts to connect are purely transactional. They're not authentic interests. Although Meryl Streep may actually be the only character who has an authentic interest in Chinese culture. She's actually trying to learn the language. She's actively practicing Tai Chi. These things that don't necessarily make her more money per se or more prestige, but show just an authentic interest. But it is still couched in her ability to finance all of these operations, right? So there is a a certain perhaps rhetorical motivation for her to to learn those things. Uh, so the authenticity of these connections is always in question. And um, and that's something that Lu Jing kind of just unwittingly immerses himself in, like many, many postdoctoral and PhD students. Um, and that's something that I was going to be focusing on for some of the, the research for the data that I was going to bring to this. Um, at the University of Arizona, we were lucky to have uh, a kind of a cadre of professors, research professors who were focusing on organizational structure in academia and at the Center for Research and Higher Education. And I believe the the department head, or at least he was the department head when I was there, um, Dr. Gary Rhodes had written, he had made his name on many, on publications around the the pay structures, the the workplace protections, and the agreements that are formed between administration and professors, and between professors and graduate students and postdocs, um, as various kinds of subclasses of, you know, if we think of them as socioeconomic classes of the university system, and in the United States, we're we're facing this, you know. There's been plenty of talk recently in politics and in popular media about the structural racism, the kind of neo-colonial or neo-imperial politics of the United States and its business practices. And the university itself has, in in recent years, become a kind of pseudo-corporate machine, right, where the, the number one way in which they make their money is through international students, people willing to pay more money to be here, or through um, the ex, when it comes to graduate students, the exploitation of those graduate students. Um, and they definitely do do it with domestic graduate students. There is definitely, um, because of the power imbalance between a tenured professor and a, who makes money through grants, especially in the sciences, and a PhD student who is, completely dependent upon that person to get their degree um, or a postdoc who's per arguably even more vulnerable in the sense that they can't just switch institutions. They are already locked into their field, but they do not yet have the protection of a tenure track. And um, they are arguably costing the university more money than a PhD student. So there is more animus put on them to, to produce more work. <coughs> Um, this is only exaggerated in the relationships between um, PIs or, you know, science, scientific leads on grants 
um, but also in the humanities, of course. It's just less exaggerated in the humanities because a lot of graduate students or postdocs in humanities programs are funded through endowments or through state funding. A lot of programs, even the University of Arizona's humanities programs, don't typically let in graduate students unless they're going to be fully funded um, so that, the, you know, they're given like a contract that guarantees them eight years of funding or six years of funding if you already have a master's um, to to teach, have your tuition covered, have your health insurance, although they're still not getting paid adequately for the number of hours they put in. Most graduate students are expected to put in 20 hours a week. Uh, and most that I knew were putting in far more than that, especially when you consider grading or their own research time. And when it comes to science grad students, a lot of times they don't have those same kinds of contractual prote protections or funding. They need to be a part of someone's grant and have a research program or idea in place such that by the time they've proposed a PhD dissertation, um, they already have an idea for the funding lined up. And a lot of a lot of grants do require some strict oversight so that professors can't do the kinds of exploitation or abuse that we saw in the film. Um, but from what I understand, a lot of specifically NSF, National Science Foundation grants, um, do not have the same kind of year-over-year -year oversight that, say, the... NCBI or the um, national NIH, like in National Institutes of Health have. So um, a professor could in theory, if they're on an NSF grant, bring on a graduate student, um, say they're going to fund them for six years, right? Or three years or however long the grant is. And implicit in that agreement would be the idea that the PhD student would get the opportunity to conduct their experiment or their research using the lab facilities that are provided by the grant, by their PhD uh, mentor. But there's nothing really in many NSF grants written into them that explicitly provide oversight on that. So you could, in theory, just use your postdoc or your, your grad student to conduct your experiments and hardly ever give them any time to conduct their own in the lab. Um, to the point where it's been six years, right? And the grant's going to run out and they haven't even gotten a chance to do their own, the research they would need to do to prove their thesis or their PA or their dissertation. Um, and, and no one can really stop you. I mean, there are sometimes faculty led internal committees or, um, uh, graduate student unions or these other kinds of, um, protections in place that can issue citations or um, reprimands against professors that pr practice these kinds of things. But it is just all too easy, especially if the PI, if the student's visa, which are typically fairly short term and have to be renewed frequently, if that's in the hands of the PI um, to sign off on, then there is that additional layer, right? That this person could be deported almost like an undocumented laborer or something, right? That they could be, if you don't do what I say, um, then you could be deported. And um, much of the, the research and analysis on the, the fate and experiences of young scientists focuses on PhD students and postdocs. And there has been some recent research in this area that some of the findings of which I might um, try to share with you, but um, the, uh, there was a, a study published, I believe, in 2018, so fairly recently, um, on 97 PhD students and postdocs from five R1s in the United States, as well as their 35 PIs, um, and more than half of the of the postdocs worked in the life sciences. About a third of them worked in physics or math. And the remainder worked in social sciences and humanities. But um, many of the issues reported by these people are are familiar. Chiefly, you know, when they're done with their PhD or their postdoc, it's extremely hard to land a tenured full time position in academia. I mean, I myself, I did maybe 
150 applications last year. I went to, and I went on 10 campus visits out of 150. So you're looking at less than a 10% actual callback rate, right? Like this is, this is, this is a job market that resembles something more similar to trying to make it in professional athletics or as a Hollywood actor, right? Like that you're going to audition a thousand times before you become a star or before you become drafted by a, a football team or something. Um, and so with that in mind, so many PhD students and postdocs are, um, you know, there's also this new complaint that's growing among many young scientists. And that's that many PIs are exploiting the fact that overseas scientists beyond what already domestic students are facing, uh, that the overseas scientists also rely on them for their visas. And um, here's a quote actually from one of the, uh, one of the authors of that study, that 2018 study uh, by that they interviewed a postdoc uh, at a, at one of the R1s. He said, when I arrived at the university, my PI explained to me that he, uh, that he was the one who would approve my visa renewal. And he then told me he was going to pay me 70% of the salary that was in the contract that he promised before I got there. When I asked him if this is normal, he just asked me if I was serious about working in the U at a U.S. university. And another one says, RPI creates a pressure cooker environment in our lab. You see the foreign postdocs sleeping on the floor of the labs, working 100 plus hours a week. The PI knows what they are doing and they take advantage of these guys. So, and which of course you saw with, with um, Ricer giving him the calculations he needed to do before, before tomorrow, right? I have a journal deadline tomorrow. Just do all of this tonight. And then on top of that, it's not even due tomorrow. He just made him do it and expected him to do it. Um, and administrators, you know, were also interviewed in that process. And, and one of them said, I see something bad almost every week and it seems to be getting worse. PhD students come into my office and ask me if this or that seems wrong or abnormal to me. The visa issue is a big one because foreign postdocs and PhD students are afraid to report their PIs. These are small scientific cadres and PIs will blackball their postdocs or their PhD graduates in recommendations if you cross them. So there's also that additional level. You are basically enslaved to your to to the opinion of your PI, right, or to your PhD um, chair, and so a lot of these, you know, this might sound like anecdotal reports, um, but there is um, over forty six percent of those interviewed felt that they were doing that they were. Um, that their visa was on the line if they didn't do what their PI asked. And over 70% said that they felt like they were going over the hours explained or outlined in their contract. So what we're dealing with is a very exploitative kind of environment. And, and while this film represents it in a very personal way with individuals, it's hopefully some of this information also highlights the systematicity of this issue, that this isn't just one postdoc going on a shooting spree or one PhD student who's mentally unstable. I mean, we hear that argument with gun control all the time. Oh, this is just one crazy guy, right? Like it, part of the reason that this is becoming systemic is because of the structure, the pay scales and the power dynamic between um, tenured chairs of PhDs or PhD students and and the students themselves who might be strung out indefinitely so long as they can find funding to try and get their PhD done, or for postdocs who may not be able to find a full time position yet. And so and that the market for those kinds of people for graduate students, postdocs, adjuncts, um, visiting professors, VAPs, visiting assistant pro teaching professors and assistant professors is only growing at a far faster rate than tenure track positions are. I mean, last time I checked, tenure track positions made up 15 to 20% of the current job openings in the humanities. And I'm not sure in the sciences how that plays out. But if you look at say the MLA job list or something, you're going to get a, a mass of 
lectureships, instructorships, visiting pro assistant professorships, and maybe one out of five of those is going to be tenure tracks. Um, and so you're, you're, so it's a, the, the few who do get these positions are in a place where they have all the power and very little accountability. Um, and of course, that is something that needs to change. And, and, and of course I'm open in discussion now, um, to any ideas that people may have around these issues, different solutions people have potentially thought of or um and also how they relate to the film so thank you for for listening to my spiel on the structural and socio-political side of this and thank you to huali for explaining the symbolic or cultural side of the composition of the film so thank you i want to thank you matthias and also i hope to do a little mini presentation maybe on the riser jacob's ladder aspect from the west you know because he what you just said, remember, he's the ladder, and then it shoots and ladders. If you don't play the game, you get the la ladder, then you get the shoot. I have a, a little short um, chat there that I just would like everybody to see. Can you all see it? We've been getting a flurry of emails from the University of Arizona security chiefs after the shooting of the hydrology professor by a man who was a Middle Eastern origin student, I believe his name was Durish Mur Dervish Murad. So he was another international student. Um, and so as we were working on this, I kept getting these emails about what shall we do? More security, more security. Well, that's just one way of looking at it. And I was thinking, I don't know how to do this, but I would like them to view this film, the people at the U of A security, because there are other aspects that, you know, I don't know how to bring, I'm, I'm working on how to bring that in. But so this film works not only at a macro level, I think of, of different cultures, but you know, there, it may be useful. It may actually be useful. Now, anybody else now you wanted, shall we open it up then to the comments from everybody? Bring them on, bring them on folks. Unmute yourselves and feel free. Yeah, uh, this is Tim. Um, this is oh. Elizabeth. Oh, sorry. My hound is howling at me. Just one <laughs> second. <Yeah. Woo! laughs> the, my name, yeah, this is Tim. I didn't, didn't watch the movie before, but this definitely makes me gonna run and watch it number one number two those those presentations both of you it's so super fascinating that i i'm at awe to see how much is in that film through your eyes and your minds and so and i'm gonna my my my, my daughter is a she speaks chinese she's gonna go to china later this this uh this year to start uh, her masters and i'm going to tell her to 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 watch this watch the presentation before and then watch the movie because you know the presentation uh, and all the symbolism that uh, professor wali provided is 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 quite amazing actually to see how it's all threads into the the the, the body of the of the film I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it very very soon maybe tonight and um, and thank you again it was most fascinating and and for for M Matthias yes this is a a major issue this whole uh, stranglehold on the on the in the academia and all of that man it is a mess and frustrating. And uh, I don't know how, how to solve it. There is no solution, not me, I'm not gonna solve it, but I don't know if there is any solution to this. It's like, uh, it's becoming less and less uh, uh, available for all these PhDs, uh, no jobs and a lot of frustrations, a lot of years wasted, quote unquote. Uh, it's a tough one. I don't know how to keep one's sanity given all these pressures.
family pressures, sacrifices, and all of that. It's it's a tough one. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I can make a comment. The things that have changed in some regards is I was on a doctoral fellowship back in the 1960s. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I got pregnant, the grant was withdrawn. Yeah. I was told I would be able to finish out the semester, yeah. which which I did. And we published our paper. Yeah. And I moved on and shifted fields. and <laughs> But there weren't a lot of options in those days. So I think maybe in some regards, it had gotten a little better than it was back then. But uh, it was always sort of, and there were people I worked with and I was in mathematics that were in that field that were, uh, oh, six years, eight years into their do doctoral program. And especially the ones with families that also had to work part-time. They were like in their thirties and they weren't seeing getting a degree anytime soon. And uh, so that, that's gone on for a long time. These people were, so I was sort of glad I didn't end up in that position. I moved to computers, which turned out to be a better field. Thank you, Nancy. That is the that's good and for me. information I didn't know about how it used to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, hearing about how it used to be before the kind of post 1980s shift towards the defunding of academia, you know, towards and the the shrinking of the job market for professors. I mean, part of it is due to, you know, the state defunding and federal defunding, you know, and, and shifting everything towards students bearing the costs of e education as opposed to, you know, uh, a grant or a, or state funding for TA ships and things like that. You know, those, it, it shrinks the field, of course, um and the i would say that it also um there was also a big movement post 70s post 80s to deunionize everything as well right like the um arizona was a right to work state when i was there i think it still is it's very anti union montana being up here in the montana university system um, I'm not sure how it is down at the Bozeman campus. Maybe you can speak on that, Wally. But um, the Haver campus, the Northern campus, is is heavily unionized, which um, has been helpful in many regards to know exactly like what your protections are from administration and what your what you can offer students um, in terms of protections without getting punished for that. Um, and, you know, the unionization of graduate students at this point is still on a kind of pseudo unofficial level. Like there can be graduate student unions, for instance, that can speak up if like a certain graduate student is struggling, right? And kind of collectivize around like the issue that they're facing. Um, but they may not have the same kind of national um or statewide pull that an official union might have. Um, and so the, I think that part of it is going to be, even if not everyone's in the union, it, what we have seen in the economy is that the slowing of wages across the board, regardless of industry, uh, correlates with the deunionizing of the United States of the of the the drop in unionization below I think the critical number that at least um, I heard from uh, Rob Reich the you know the old Department of or uh, Secretary of um, I believe he was the chief economic advisor to the. Obama administration is that the sweet number is at least 30%. If at least a third of the United States' industri industries were unionized, that that would create enough pull to continue pushing wages up, to continue pushing worker protections and benefits and 
all these kinds of things up. Um, but without that, we've kind of moved into a, a place where everyone's just fighting over jobs and people assume that you'll get paid more if you're not in the union, but that's almost never true. You, you, you get a little carrot at the beginning if you don't want to join the union, like, oh, you'll get, you'll start at a higher pay than people in the union, but the people in the union almost always crawl to a higher over time to a higher pay than the people who aren't in the union. Um, and so that's, that's something that could be done would be uh, a more formal unionizing of graduate students and postdocs, um, whether field specific or just across the board. Um, just relative to what I've seen being in a non-unionized university and state, as opposed to one that's more heavily unionized, there is a very different culture around how to treat faculty, how to treat graduate students and their relationship to the administration, because the power dynamic is just so different. <sighs> yeah, in, in Bozeman campus, I believe tenure track faculty doesn't have a union because I remember a few years ago we had a vote so then <laughs> you know then later after the vote yeah so faculty doesn't have a union but we do have a union for non-tenure track adjunct instructors or yeah do you call I'm not sure about the graduate students if they have a union or not but because uh, I'm uh, no faculty senate Senator represent my department. I attended the meeting and uh, the graduate student the university is revising um, some regulations uh, regarding graduate students, especially you know the the qualify examination or those exams. If you fail, are you really be out of the program or stop? Yeah, that's something we are doing revisions because some students some doctoral students, especially if they didn't do well in the exam, then they, they, they're, they're out of the program. So now they're looking at it again to see, because they may do a lot of research already, they didn't prepare well in the exam, then they didn't do well in the exam, then you end their career, right? So all the, the years, you know, they spend, so just in vain, right? Yeah, so that's something they they try to change, right? That's what I'm being aware of. If I may interject, I have another um, returning to the film. I don't know this. This is a long thing, but I thought I'd put it in the chat if you can all see it. Um, there, there's a fantastic scholar who's dealing with this Orientalism, and that was a book that came out in the '80s, I believe, by Saeed. But, oh, Journey to the West, not Wet. <laughs> Sorry. But that, that movie had a lot of rain in it. Um, so these, these people who are the colonial subjects, the, the client states, the poor people we're supposed to be exploiting, nothing will set off people more than that they start moving to the capital of the colony, col colonializers. Oh, they hate that. So this is about the 19th century when we first started getting popular level literature. Uh, even Dracula, he's one of the colonial subjects way out in the Balkans who ends up in London, oh horrors, you know, and we can't have that. And of course he's going to marry our women and that's exogamy fear or, or take their blood, mix his blood with their blood. So you notice in the film, uh, Dark Matter, there's a lot of that. You know, I'm coming to wed your daughter. I'm after your daughter. Look, I want the blonde girl. So, so that is a prominent aspect that is being taken up. This um, fictions of loss, the, the loss of the male control of their own women. And of course, we see um, Riser controlling the women. He controls his secretary. He even he brings this woman over like a camel in a camel market. Look at her. She represents the U.S. How about that? You know, it's like. We say that they do that in other cultures, and he's parading this woman at the conference. So um, it's it's definitely male versus male exom exogamy. I can't say the word fears going on in this, and and that that is another thread. 
And um, I just want to type in the word Jacob's Ladder because it is not accidental that the Nobel guy's name is Jacob Reiser. Oh, not Rezier, Reiser, R E I S, Reiser. So it has the connotation of, you know, he's the ladder. It all depends on him. It's Jacob's ladder, Jacob's ladder, or you could play shoots and ladders. Then when you go against Jacob, you get into the shoot out. Oh. So there are many scenes in the film, again, that depend on this person being very marginal and a colonial subject, not supposed to be running the show there at the Capitol. And the, the latter scenes are, are represented. If you go back, those who have watched the film, go back and look at how many scenes are part of them at least take place on staircases, people going upstairs, even during the, during the shooting, well, I'm, I, you, you have to pardon us, Tim, because you're going to get spoilers. Even during the shooting at the end, half of that scene is on a staircase, and he's going down the staircase, and Cindy, the wife, is going up the staircase. And right before that, when he writes this kind of glowing letter with the money to his parents, um, Liu Xing, there's a ghost of a staircase on the side of a building as he walks to the post box there's a you cannot see the outline of a ghostly that no longer exists staircase it's gone it's been destroyed but there's the outline in the paint of the staircase and just note you know i, I haven't done that yet i'm getting kind of like ocd on this I've, I've timed and clocked every one of the music references but um now the next time i watch it i can clock all the staircase and so this this may also have a corollary in, in Chinese culture about staircases because I haven't even thought to look into the, the symbolic meaning of staircases in, in the Chinese side. But on the West side, it comes right out of the Bible, Jacob's dream of the, the ladder and the angels are going connecting heaven and earth in that biblical reference, the angels going up and down the ladder, connecting heaven and earth. Mm. There, I make my case if I were a forensic lawyer on that <laughs> on that particular metaphor. And so I'm sorry to you know I just wanted to bring that in before we ended because I was so fond of it, the Jacob Ladder. Right. I also there is another uh, detail I noticed that at the beginning of the movie when he Liu Xin first arrived, uh, states a uh, campus, he went to the statue. Mm, but the okay. kind of statue, right? Then at the end of the movie, before the shooting scene, he came, he was wearing a white jacket and came to the statue again. It seems, you know, saying farewell mm -hmm. to to this world or to America, right? It's highly symbolic. And then after that, he went to the 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 the, the, the award winning ceremony for Lawrence, right? Then right, did the right. killing, everything. That's does white symbolize death in Chinese culture? Oh yeah, definitely white. Yeah, symbolize death because I had a funeral. So it's you not know, a black jacket, we, everybody. It's yeah, we, we wear white. You know, especially in, in rural uh, area, people really wear you know white color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the, the film was really well done. They, they they echo you know each other the different scenes you know the, the director didn't forget it and then later they went back to the earlier motif so a lot of contrast there related to each other mm. and also yeah so Mattis uh, mentioned that a kind of materialism right the student want to search for free food right oh stuff yourself then you don't have to eat dinner. Right, I, I also, I think it also related to the poverty, you know, graduate students are poor, right, especially those from, uh, from China, right, because uh, in reality, the Liu Xin came to states in the late 1980s, imagine late 1980s, China was very, very poor, totally different from what it is now, right, so starving, you know, having enough food is a major issue, 
so it's not really utility. Well, it is kind of practical, right? But of course, you want to go wherever they give you good food, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I there, wanna. I there's wanna... Uh, the just to get back to your stairs, the significance of stair scenes. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest one that stands out to me is the one where Ricer is going up the stairs, and um, Liu Jing's at the bottom of the stairs, and he tries to confront him. Like, I've redone the calculations; has huge implications for cosmology, and. Mm -hmm. Riser's at the top of the stairs and says, you need to pay your dues first, right? Like it's that yeah. scene where it's the scene yeah. about paying your dues. That's mm -hmm. probably the most significant one to me that's on a on a staircase because it's like I'm at the top of the stairs. And it, you will you can get to the top of the stairs if you pay your dues, but if you keep going with what you're saying, you're going to be on this ladder forever, like a Jacob's ladder that just and, keeps and even that is a reincarnating lie. itself. That that is also a lie because when he's enclosed where the Chinese students can't hear him in that elevator, which is going down, he says terrible things about them. So he's that prejudiced against them that that's not really true. <laughs> you know what you're yeah, saying. He, you know? It's clear he's like he's a straight up racist by the end yeah. by the he's like, I don't like their food. They do whatever you want, which is the only reason I like them. Like that's literally like his philosophy is he that says, they Underneath <laughs> it all, they're probably all little arrogant bastards, you know. He's such right, a right, a kind of a culture, yeah, culture supremacy here, right? He said, "Oh, those Chinese students are grateful to whatever things I give them, ask them to do, right?" Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. The, the secretary said that you've never been to China. He said, "I don't need to go there. I, I'm a theorist, right? Yeah. I don't even like Chinese food." So this is this kind of a very arrogant attitude, right? But then the, the, the lady, the secretary said that actually those students come from a culture with, she said, a 2,000 year history, that actually 5,000 year history. Yes, they must look yeah. at us as a barbarian, right? With a, such a short history. So it's a kind of very interesting uh, conversation there from time to time. Yeah, he it's it's he's definitely engaging in these tropes, these racist tropes that are like mm -hmm. very old in terms of their their rootedness in american culture at least going back as far as like the 19th century this whole like mm -hmm. idea that, oh you know east asians work really hard and they'll do whatever you say and they, but they but their food is disgusting and they they don't know anything about america so they're very easy to manipulate right it's kind of his his whole philosophy for why he and i mean and all of his postdocs are East Asian students, Asian, or, or, yeah. or you know, like you, I don't think you see a single white or no. or Arab or black uh, yeah. PhD student at all. They're all East Asian or Chinese. You know, <laughs> I think uh, Matthias and Wally that that is necessary for him to do to be able to sleep at night. If he didn't have that negative kind of reductionist view, then he would be hurting real people, <laughs> hurting real people like that. But if he maintains that reduct reductive image, they, they're they they're not like us. So this is even better than what they have. So I'm not gonna worry about it. Actually, I have a real question to ask the audience or professors here, because I didn't understand that. Uh, Reza said that, oh, China is a country where cosmology is still considered a science because I'm from China, but I'm not a scientist at all. But I do, I will, I, I truly believe cosmology is a science. So is there a kind of a culture difference here? So cosmology is not science, it's a, it's a, it's a what? Astrology, astrology with an A. Yeah, astrology. Uh, so it's yeah. not science. No. At least, you know, since the since the medieval period, probably in the West, they've considered uh -huh. astrology to be more of like a a pseudoscience or a you know almost a religion, like a uh, oh really you know a, a belief that like you know the the belief that like the stars and the alignments of planets and the seasons cause 
different energies and such and um, are associated with different behaviors or feelings is, you know, in the in the West, that's seen as now like uh, more like magic than as a, as science, you know? <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's really new to me. Yeah. yeah, this concept is really new to me because, of course, in China, you think of uh, cosmology or all those stars at, at a metaphysical level, but if in university, in academia, it's, it's a kind of a scientific subject you're studying. So that's why I was very surprised to hear this. I, I didn't get it. I said, why? Why, why did he say that? So I, I think there must be a kind of a culture uh, differences involved here, but thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> but, 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 but does um, in China, do they do the study of cosmology studies the predictions and- uh, No. Yeah, so maybe the, the terminology is a bit different then. I, I, I believe so, because uh, we use astronomy. Yeah, cause I think there's a kind of uh, you know translation involved, right? Cosmology and astronomy. For me, they're probably the same. I but now I'm aware of the, <laughs> the difference now, because <laughs> I just think it, it is astronomy, but just in different way we are talking about it, right? Yeah, because in the film Liu Xing also said that he's studying. Cosmology instead of saying I'm studying astronomy, but if you go to Chinese uh, university's website, they, you know, if it's you know English version, they say astronomy, but in this film they use cosmology. That's why I was confused. Cosmology, yeah, it's true. cosmology it's like it... is cosmology is a sub grouping under astronomy. astronomy. Astronomy is the bigger generic. Cosmology is the study of the formation and structure of the universe. Right, yeah. but then um, it is a science. It is a science. It is a science. Yeah. It yeah, is that's a science. One that isn't a science is astrology with an L. That That is what we're talking about. Astrology, not astrology. Oh, astrology. Okay, astrology. okay. I see. That's the mm -hmm. one where you have a sign and, you know, it's your, you're a Taurus or whatever. That's astrology, not, cos not cosmology. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah, I was yeah, kind of uh, confused it's, the way it's, he it's said also that. It's also a difficult translation into, like, into Russian, for instance, like in Russian mm -hmm. sciences. Cosmology is astronomy because the word for space in Russian is cosmos, like cosmonaut. Yeah. So it like cosmology, they wouldn't even use the word astronomy. They would use cosmology for all of astronomy, whereas yeah. mm -hmm. in English, right. astronomy is kind of the umbrella. And then cosmology is just that one theoretical, yeah, like sub discipline about why the universe is the way it is or where it came from, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, I think that this is this is a film that is going to go down like James Joyce's Ulysses with the literal levels. It's like rings from the nano to the cosmological. And it just is what it is. And the fact that it was overlooked now that we're away from that bad timing aspect Hopefully, people will get to see it and they will understand some of these problems that it takes on. And I'm so glad that and honored that both of you would come and bring your expertise to share with us on understanding this film. Any other comments or? Well, questions? thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, I will say, uh, next time, we're going to have the famous Jack Dan, who's now a resident in Australia. We're bringing someone from Australia, and he's going to be speaking about an alternate history book that he's very famous in the field of science fiction. Um, and, you know, I'll, I will not belabor all the details, but he has an, an alternate history. It's a guide how to write alternate histories. So I hope you'll be with us next time. Very literary one next in May. And thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you, you. Everyone. thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah.
You too. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Mm,